So this would be another example of um, driven uh, LRC circuit. Now, as you look at this and try to figure out how to do that using phasers, um, you can't really, or you can't do it easily. Because in order to do this analysis, what you need is you need to add these elements in parallel. And you haven't been given rules to how to add phasers in parallel. Because uh, I think you can, uh, I figured out that rule at some point, but that was so complicated that it wasn't worth using. So, um, so that's the limitation of your textbook approach. It'll just limit you to whatever circuit elements are in series because it's not versatile enough to handle anything other than that. And uh, what I'd like to show you in this lecture in the next, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes is uh, let me first uh, redo what the textbook has already done with a series of uh, LRC circuit because that'll give uh, us a way to compare our answers to see if the approach I'm using is actually yielding the exact same answer textbook has already gotten for LRC circuit. And then, um, and then we'll uh, go on from there to analyze these new circuits and see how their behavior is different. I think uh, I want this lecture topic to be um, LRC circuit analysis, plural, uh, with complex impedances. So let me give you a quick reminder of uh, something that was covered in lecture. Uh, complex impedances. <laughs> so if you imagine this circuit element, register. So what complex, what impedance is, is a, it's a kind of generalized idea of resistance. Um, the motivation for impedance, as you see it in lecture, it comes from trying to uh, recover the simple form of Ohm's law in the more complicated cases. So this impedance being the generalized idea of a resistance when it comes to the impedance of a resistor, well, that's just the resistance. You know, it's the idea of itself being itself. <laughs> now, when you have other circuit elements like capacitor, uh, they have different impedances. Impedance of a capacitor is 1 over imaginary number times omega, angular frequency at which you are driving the circuit, times C. And the impedance of an inductor is imaginary number times omega times L. So these are impedances to you know drive it or intuit it. You'll have to work through some situations. I've done that in the other lectures. So I'll just use this as a given thing that we are given complex impedances. And um, uh, so this is being generalized the idea of uh, resistance. It means whenever you have these elements, you can add them like you add registers. So for example, if you had them just in series, resistance, capacitance, and inductance. Okay, <laughs> let me just write L. And let's say you are trying to get some results out of this circuit, so you connect it to an AC power source, one that provides um, fixed uh, um, fixed amplitude of voltage. So I might, in the realm of complex impedances, I might describe this voltage source as being a function of time with some amplitude of V naught, and then uh, the complex part, e to the i omega t. If I'm trying to do this without complex numbers, I might be uh, describing this e to the i omega t as a cosine of omega t, and so on. So let's imagine you have these uh, three elements connected in series. And um, I just said you can add these elements like you add registers. So what that means is if you're trying to combine them all into a black box, and you're trying to think of what is the equivalent impedance of these three elements added together. Well, you add them like registers in series. So you say, okay, that's uh, my resistance, done, plus the impedance of the capacitance, 1 over i omega c, plus the impedance of uh, inductor, i omega l. And that's your equivalent uh, impedance. And um, the whole motivation for introducing impedance being um, trying to recover the simple form of Ohm's law, you can say from Ohm's law, the voltage across all three circuit elements 
is given by their equivalent impedance times the current as a function of time. So I can imagine taking this, solve it for current. Current as a function of time is the voltage, which is V0 e to the I omega t, divided by the equivalent resistance, which I wrote up here. Uh, R plus 1 over I omega c plus I omega l. And I guess uh, you could uh, leave it here, except it's not much of an analysis. It doesn't add uh, much of an insight. So um, let's uh, just uh, separate out a little bit. So we're going to uh, separate out this e to the i omega t dependence, which um, I'll find a way to handle. So I have the coefficient. So we not divide by. Oh, and uh, let me do this as well. So I see this uh, nested fraction, and I never liked nested fractions that kind of mess with my visual. So I'm going to try to get rid of this nested fraction. The way to do it would be to multiply top and bottom separately by i omega c by i omega c. On the numerator, you get what you get. On the denominator, this is expected to cancel this out so that you don't have any more nested fractions. So let's do that. So let's uh, write down what's going to be on the numerator. So that would be V0 times I omega C divided by, uh, let me be careful here. Um, so I'm multiplying I omega C to every single term. So it'll be uh, I omega c times r plus this will become one that was the whole point uh, and then finally the last term here it will be minus uh, because of i squared and then omega squared times lc minus omega squared lc all right, um, that, as you stare at it, it might not be quite informative. Uh, let me just make a little bit of space here. Like, what does that even mean? Uh, it is a little bit helpful to kind of separate separate out different parts. There's this time-dependent part, e to the i omega t, which I'm going to ignore for now. And for the expression for current, uh, let me write this fraction this way. So we have... Uh, V0 times I omega C divided by, let me write the real part first. So I think this combined is the real part. Um, 1 minus omega squared LC plus I omega RC. So as you look at this expression, you can get some things just by staring at the expression. Um, one thing that you can get is one question that you can actually answer by staring at the expression is the question at what angular frequency is current maximized. And if you are thinking, this is so, such a complicated expression, how could you uh, get that by simply staring at it? Um, I focus on the part where I see um, potential for cancellation. So I'm so if I'm trying to maximize current, I'm trying to minimize the denominator. And um, here, other than making omega zero, I, I can't do anything there. But in this term, there's a, a value of omega that's not zero that'll make this real part zero. Um, that value being omega equal to square root of uh, one over LC. So if you plug that in there, square it, LC cancels out, you get 1, 1 minus 1, hey, that's a 0. So this is the resonance frequency. That's something you can get just by staring at it. Um, the rest of it, it'll need a, a bit of a mathematical sophistication, which is, um, I want to look at it this way. So... Um, I, I have this complex number and uh, I need to explain a little bit of um, tricks about uh, dealing with the complex numbers. So looking at this number as a whole, I, I can think of this like uh, it, it's a complex number uh, g, lowercase g. 
And when you have a complex number, you have two different ways of representing it. You can represent it in the Cartesian form, a plus uh, i times b, or you can represent it in the polar form. Um, let me not use the r because that's going to get confusing. Lowercase r times some magnitude times a complex exponential, e to the i phi. And you can see that it's going to take a quite a bit of work to even to get this to look something like um, a plus i b. I have to rationalize the fraction and separate that. I could do it. And it's not really going anywhere that way. Um, so let me just not get go here at all. And just to deal with this expression, let's imagine I'm trying to write out this complex number. You know, V naught i omega c divided by 1 minus omega squared lc plus i omega rc. I'm trying to write this in this way. Um, I want to write it out so that the complex phase factor is pulled out and um, what, uh, what it's multiplying to will be basically the absolute value of the complex number. And this might actually sound like an even more complicated thing. How do you calculate that? Uh, the, so this is the trick about working with the complex numbers. Imagine doing this calculation just because you can. Product of complex conjugation of this num this complex number times itself. And this complex conjugation, it's a, the operation for it is really simple. It's obtained by replacing wherever you see i with minus i. And um, if you have any complex variables, you have to also conjugate it. But r and phi are both going to be real. So here, um, the, the g conjugate would be r times e to the minus i phi. Uh, this is a simple calculation. Let's do it. When you do it, you have r times e to the minus i phi times r times e to the i phi. You get r times r, r squared. You get e to the minus i phi times e to the i phi. They just cancel out. So this uh, product here gives you the, the uh, magnitude squared. So when I want to calculate this, the really simple operation to calculate that is, OK, let me write this out. That's going to be equal to square root of the complex conjugate of this number. It takes some steps, but it's simple to write it out. Let me write out v naught times minus i omega c divided by 1 minus omega squared lc and then minus i omega rc. That's the complex conjugate. That times the original complex number. v naught i omega c divided by 1 minus omega squared LC uh, plus I omega RC. And then square root all of that, that'll give us the that magnitude. So let's go through that algebra. It's a little bit tedious, but um, uh, it'll be well worth it. <laughs> let's uh, write it out. So and it's actually not that hard. Um, so it's a square root of, I have V naught squared, and minus i times i gives me plus 1. All right, so I don't have to do anything there. I have omega squared, this is squared. Oh, this is going to get pulled out of square root. OK, that's being divided by. The denominator is a little more complicated. Um, let me do this easy part first. I have real part times real part. I can kind of treat this as one unit. Let me just write it out. 1 minus omega squared LC squared okay and i have cross terms that will cancel like this times that plus or you know, so let me highlight it this times that plus this times this they will cancel each other because one product was done with the plus sign the other product is done with the minus sign so those cross terms will cancel i won't even write them down because they will just cancel the only remaining part I have to deal with is the imaginary part multiplied to imaginary part. 
So minus i times i, that gives me plus, plus 1, and then omega squared, r squared, c squared. Good? Um, I guess I can simplify this a little bit, maybe. So let me do this. I'm going to do two operations at the same time. So I'm going to pull out v naught squared. So I'll have that. Or um, pull it out of the square root, so it'll just become v naught. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply top and bottom within the square root thing by 1 over omega squared c squared. Uh, I think that'll eventually end up looking a little bit simpler. So this term, out of this term, I have, um, let me write it out. I have square root of omega squared c squared gets canceled out when I do multiplying top and bottom by 1 over omega squared c squared. So this will be um, r squared. And then the remaining term here, um, I could write it as uh, plus. So this is being squared. When I bring this inside here, it becomes division by omega c. So it'll be 1 over omega c minus 1 factor of omega cancels. So omega l and then c cancels squared. So this is the result. So this is the um this is the result here. So let's uh, kind of track our way back here. Uh, let me just uh, erase this to make room. So tracking ourselves back here. Um, for our original expression for the current that we are still trying to write out, we can say that, okay, that current is, there's some time dependent part and there will be some this uh, complex phase part that we'll just leave alone for now. And then um, for the the kind of the quantity that determines the magnitude, we can now say copying and pasting this that this will give you the magnitude of the current. So if uh, someone was asking, um, you know, question like what is the IRMS? then I can say, oh, uh, this top part being, you know, that's like a VRMS, or it'll be proportional to VRMS. I can say, hmm, I can write that in terms of VRMS by dividing it by this factor here. All these other things, they um, in computing something like root mean square quantity, they will disappear, they will become one. So this will be uh, VRMS divided by square root of R squared plus 1 over omega c minus omega l squared. Now, let's uh, compare this result with what your textbook uh, derives. So looking at series R is the circuit, they do all this stuff. Great, great, great. Nothing wrong with that. So phase vector they did. We skipped it. Uh, we'll leave it skipped. We'll, we are just using this to kind of check the validity of this approach. And then um, uh, we'll do the phase vector for the other circuit we'll analyze. So, um, so we have, okay, I naught is, ah, there it is. And this is how your textbook wrote it. And you can kind of see hints of that here, especially in this rewritten form. And um, this is G here, it's that. And did they ever plug in the actual quantities? Okay, they didn't, but they did cover XL. The impedance of an inductor was omega L minus one over, the impedance of capacitors, one over omega C. And that's this. Uh, the minus uh, being swapped around doesn't matter because we are squaring it anyway. So yeah, this is the same formula that's in the textbook. So you can analyze a series RS circuit this way. And the the benefit of this approach using um, using complex impedance to analyze a circuit like a series LRC circuit that uh, even your textbook covers is that um, is that I didn't have to draw any drawing. This was just uh, algebra. So once you get used to the way of doing uh, complex algebra, then this is so much easier. One, two, you didn't actually lose any information like what your textbook was covering with the phasor diagrams. All that information is still here. Like if you represent these in the complex plane, you will get the 
equivalent version of a representation using phasor diagrams. Now, what we are going to do next, next uh, five to 10 minutes, is, um, is really the advantage of this approach. It's highly adaptable. You can use this to not just analyze a series LRC circuit, which again, your textbook already does. I've simply redone it different, uh, in a different way. Um, but let's say you had a slightly different circuit. So let me take this beginning part of it and we'll just change it all out, around a little bit. Instead of these uh, circuit elements being in series, let's say um, you move it around a little bit. So let's say your register will be in series with the power supply. Let me actually put it here. But your capacitor and inductor, they won't be in series with this. Instead, you are going to put capacitor and inductor in parallel with each other. So here's the capacitor and here's the inductor. So equivalent impedance won't be this anymore. We'll have to think of a way to rewrite it. But our um, setup still remains uh, kind of similar in the sense that we do use of complex impedances, you know, generalized version of uh, resistance. You can still have a form of Ohm's law that relates the voltage and the current linearly through the impedance, the generalized uh, resistance. And if uh, you are given this circuit and trying to analyze it using phasers, it's going to be complicated. I tried it once and I don't know that I can do it correctly. Again. <laughs> the di difficult part is adding the capacitor and inductor in parallel. I think uh, doing that using phasor diagram is non-trivial. And so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the impedances. So if these two had been uh, registers, I know how to add them. They, they are in parallel. I, I know how to add registers in parallel. So I would say, okay, one over equivalent impedance of L and C um, that in reciprocals, that's going to add to one over impedance of capacitor plus one over impedance of inductor. Okay. Uh, let's write that out. So I have one over in equivalent impedance of the just the inductor and capacitor is uh, one over I omega C is just I omega C plus one over I omega L is uh, one over I omega L. All right, there's some symmetry here. <laughs> and just uh, combine the fractions, same denominator, I omega L. And then here, multiply top and bottom by I omega L. You know, that's what I'm imagining doing. I omega L, top it by I omega L. I times I, that's minus 1. So minus, and then omega squared LC. Um, and then I still have 1 plus 1. Okay, that, uh, that expression. Now I can just uh, take the reciprocal for the equivalent to impedance. It's I omega L, and let me write the one first so that I don't have to lead with a negative sign. So that's the equivalent impedance of that block. Uh, for the total equivalent impedance, I simply add it to the re impedance of the register or the resistance. So the overall impe uh, impedance, the equivalent impedance is the resistance plus I omega L divided by 1 minus omega squared LC. Okay, so, um, so with this expression, we can say this. We can say that our, um, so solving for current in that expression, the current in this circuit looks like the voltage, which is a V naught e to the I omega T, divided by the equivalent uh, impedance R plus I omega L over one minus omega squared LC. All right. <laughs> so let's let's imagine we are interested in the, the amplitude of the current. So we are imagining re rewriting this uh, into this form where this is equal to some I naught times e to the i omega t 
times potentially a phase factor. And we'll say this is going to be the real quantity. So in um, trying to get that number, we can take this uh, as my complex number g. And if we calculate square root of g complex conjugate times itself, that'll give you me a number such that, uh, let me write it out this way. The complex number g can be expressed as this real number times a complex phase factor. So if I compute this, that will give me this uh, amplitude of the uh, curve. So let's calculate that. Uh, we are calculating the absolute value of V0. This is how actually absolute value is defined in the complex um, number algebra. You, uh, so, you know, in a, with real numbers, you might have taken the number, squared it, and taken square root. Like that's one way to define the algorithm for uh, taking the absolute value. And when you are doing that with a complex number, you do something similar. You just go through an extra step of uh, taking the complex conjugate instead of squaring. So this absolute value is going to be square root of, let's uh, write the complex conjugate first. That's uh, this quantity just with all the i's replaced by minus i. It'll be v naught divided by r plus minus i omega l divided by 1 minus omega squared lc. Then number times the original complex number itself. V0 divided by r plus i omega l over 1 minus omega squared lc. I have a sense this will actually look pretty simple. So a lot of the multiplication here is a simple. You get, you know, V0 times V0, so that's V0 squared. So the most, the remaining part is working out this uh, complex e expression times this complex expression. And one thing that will simplify is again, when you do, so you get uh, R times R, so that will give you R squared. And when you multiply this with that, and then add that to, this multiplied by that, they will add up to zero. Those cross terms just uh, vanish. So with that great simplification, um, um, I, I can just write this out. So I have a v naught squared, square rooted. So let me just write v naught on the numerator. And in the denominator, I'll still square root. And I have r squared from the two real parts multiplying together. And the cross terms, they cancel out. So I'm just going to have the imaginary part multiplied to the other imaginary part. Minus i times i is plus 1. So I have plus omega squared L squared divided by um, this thing squared. Square root All right, can I simplify this a little? Let's take a look. So let's see. I don't think uh, there's much more you would... Uh, gain by um, trying to algebraically simplify this. Um, let me highlight this. So before we saw this uh, resonance frequency of omega is the square root of 1 over LC. Um, in the before circuit with the series circuit, this is where you saw the current being at maximum. Now, in this circuit, you won't see that. Um, this quantity of I not when you plug this in, you won't see this uh, getting becoming maximum. But you will see something interesting. So let's just try plugging in this uh, resonance frequency and see what happens. So when I plug this in, so um, let's just write out the expression. I have um, V naught divided by square root of R squared plus, okay, plugging that in, square it. So L squared will cancel out. So I'll have, um, actually L squared, it just, it'll, so when I square it, I get one over LC. So it just cancels one factor of L. So it'll actually have um, L divided by C divided by, I have one minus, plugging that in, I have, um, 1 over LC, uh, LC cancel, so I have 1 squared. Oh. So this is what I see. This combination here, this is approaching 0. 
which makes this entire number approach infinity. Which means this r squared is kind of irrelevant, it's insignificant, it doesn't count in anything. And this entire quantity here, representing i naught, equals to zero. So what own resonance behavior means for this circuit is that the current through the circuit will approach zero on that resonance frequency. And you can kind of uh, follow through the consequences of what that means. That means if the current flowing through the circuit approaches zero at that frequency, then the voltage drop across the register, that voltage drop will go to zero, which means all of this voltage pro being provided, that will be measured across this combination only. So you can look at the resonance for this circuit in this way, that that's the frequency at which you will measure the maximum voltage across this circuit element.